Come on. Good morning, New Hope Hawaii Kai. Uh, you know what? It is so good to be home, family. Woo, it's good to see you. We believe in a gospel this morning that can change every part of your life. This isn't positivity on steroids. This isn't every best trait of you operating at its fullest. We are talking about a God who loved you and I so much that he gave his only son that you and I would have eternal life. And this gospel is not just for our head, it's for our heart. It's not just that it would stay in our heart, it would transform the way that we think, the way that we speak, and the way that we live. We believe in a God that cares about your Monday, not just whether we sing together on Sunday. We believe in a God that cares for you on a Thursday afternoon when you think nobody sees you. Oh, but the God of the universe knows your name. He knows your name and he's got you on a path towards freedom in Christ. Family, I don't know about you, but that pumps me up. Come on. That just gets me so fired up. Does it mean that things are perfect? Absolutely not. But what it means is that there's more. That there is more than what we often settle for. And that person is Jesus Christ. 50 years ago. 50 years ago. Does anybody remember what happened 50 years ago? About nine days and 50 years ago. It would have been 1969. Anybody remember a significant event that happened in 1969? Woodstock. Woodstock. Were, you, were you there, Bob? <laughs> were you? That was <laughs> Woodstock happened. Here's where we're going. We're not going to go hang out at Woodstock. I'm sure that was an adventure. We're going to have coffee, and we're going to talk about that. <laughs> we walked on the moon. 1969, July 20th, we walked on the moon. What would be the height of, of, of technology and education and dreaming, uh, finances. We were embroiled in this space race at that time in history. We land on the moon in 1969. It was a, a moment that shaped United States history for sure, but it also impacted the globe. But there's another thing that happened on the surface of the moon that often gets uh, sort of, it disappears from the reality of what happened on that day. Yeah, we landed. That lunar module was there. Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong, they were there. But something else took place on the surface of the moon that we don't often hear about. Background of the story is that Bud Aldrin, see, Buzz Aldrin, rather, he, he, when he, he was a minister, actually, he was an elder deacon in his church at the time. And he knew that he was on the, the edge, he was on the precipice of something that had never occurred before. And he wanted to mark this moment in a way that was significant to him. He wanted to mark this because no one had ever been to the moon before, let alone doing what they were doing and so what he did is he got the pastors of his church together and he had them pray for him. And this is what they did. They prayed and they consecrated a little cup and a little chalice of wine and a little, a little wafer, a little communion wafer. And he took those things with him into space and on the surface of the moon, right next to the Sea of Tranquility, Buzz Aldrin took communion. He took communion on the moon. The first astronauts that, that actually orbited the moon and were out there, th there was a passage of Genesis that they read out as they began to orbit our planet and see all of God's creation and goodness. On the surface of the moon, however, communion was taken. It's Communion Sunday today, folks. It's not just that it's something we celebrate like once a year. As a church, we gather to take communion as a reminder of who we are in Christ, of who God is. Why communion, though? You know, so many traditions in church history have risen and fallen over time. Different things that communities and people have done, and none of them have lasted. Maybe 10, 15, 20, 100 years, but thousands of years, the sacrament of communion has followed us throughout church history. Why? Its significance is so powerful. 
It reminds us of what the sacrifice of God was about. But here's what communion isn't. Communion is not, we will actually take communion this morning. I want us to be in a perpetual state of preparation this morning for what God wants to do in our hearts. Because just in worship, I just felt like the presence of God in this place this morning, fam. Come on, he is good. Where two or more are gathered in his name, the Bible says he is present, he is here. And so why communion, though? Oh, here's what communion is in. Uh, maybe some of us grew up in a tradition that where communion was the way in which we atoned for our wrongdoing or our sin. Well, see, we are believers of the text of Scripture. Technically, I guess historically, you could say that we are Protestants in that tradition where sola scriptura, the word of God alone that directs the way in which we practice and the way in which we live out our faith. And according to scripture, see, communion isn't what forgives us of our sin. No, Jesus forgives us of our sin. Amen. When we said, Jesus, I want to serve you my whole life. I'm inviting you to be the Lord of my life. You take the wheel. I'm done with all of that. We were saved in that moment. Transformation began to take place. What communion is not is your and I's fresh start, or it's not our moment where we can forgive for what we did last week at the office or on the road or somewhere else. We come to Jesus for that. Communion is a remembrance. Communion is our moment where we can take stock of where we are right now in this place. It's calling us back. Communion is an invitation. You can actually write that down in your notes this morning, and your notes are blank. I'm sorry, I just got back on Friday. <laughs> Thank you, by the way, as a little segue, I'm halfway through that doctoral program, and I don't have to do any more traveling. Praise Jesus. <laughs> I, I am so glad to be home, family. Woo! So it is, it's a calling back. It's a remembering what our, who our first love is. It calls us to remember that if there's anything that's been in our life that's sort of trying to take top priority, what communion does as a practice is a moment of pause where we can say, no, 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 that the bills aren't my priority. No, no, that thing isn't my priority. Uh, my own desires, that's not my priority. Jesus is the priority in my life. It calls us to remembrance. It does help us to say, hey man, maybe we've been off track. Maybe if we look at the road we've been on recently, we know we've sort of been wayward. We've been wandering from God's best. Communion can be that moment where we say, okay, Jesus, I'm, I'm redirecting. I'm ratcheting back to your love. So here's what communion is, and you can write this down. Communion is our invitation. Communion is our invitation. And this morning we're going to talk about four things that what I, what I believe from Scripture we can see is, is what communion is an invitation towards. And if you have your Bibles or if you have your phones with a Bible on them, you can open them to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. You won't get it on the screen because I didn't even send it to our team. Ha, ha, ha. This is surprise, surprise. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 11, 23. It's, it's in here. You can trust me. This isn't just a fake Bible. Paul says this, I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself that night that he was betrayed. And Jesus took some bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said... This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Communion is an invitation, but what is an invitation to? I think the first thing that communion is an invitation to, just from Scripture, is communion is an invitation to look inward. 
It's an invitation to look inward. In fact, Jesus would imply these things. He would say this as he would say, look, if you go to the place of worship and before you bring your offering to God, if you have unforgiveness in your heart, if you have anything that's blocking you from walking out our command to love and forgive the way that God has, he says, leave your gift at the altar. Go reconcile with your brother or sister. Because reconciliation of the heart in that moment is far more important than a ritual or a practice. Looking inward. So what does that mean? That means that actually there may be times when we don't take communion. See, the goal of communion isn't that we all take communion because we're all perfect and we all have it all figured out and this is our reminder of how awesome we are. Actually, one huge win of communion is when we recognize there might be some things going on that would preclude me from taking communion. Can I just tell you that in my life, I've been a a follower of Jesus since I was 16 years old. There has been multiple times when that communion thing was passed around me at churches, at different camps, at places where I chose not to partake in communion. And the reason why I chose not to partake in communion is because as I approached that moment of practice, I looked inward and I knew that there was something in my heart that I needed to resolve with Jesus or someone else. And so taking communion, it wouldn't make sense for me. I'm thankful that taking communion doesn't save me. Amen? I'm thankful that Jesus saves me. Looking inward. Well, what is Paul talking about? He says that anyone who eats this bread and drinks this cup unworthily. See, the problem in 1 Corinthians 11 was that the Corinthian church was so used to excess. Like, they were the extra, extra people. If you had an awesome experience with Jesus, they had one that was 10 times better. You ever you have a friend that is like a, a story topper? Hey, this is what happened to me on Tuesday. Oh, yeah? Well, this is what happened to me on Tuesday. It's like you tell a story and they got a story that's even better. You know, in the early years of my marriage, Tara and I were story toppers. Like, I would tell a story, and then my wife would be like, oh, yeah, and she would tell a story. And then I would be like, oh, yeah, and then we would tell. It was hilarious and frustrating all at the same time until I decided she's just funnier. That's right. <laughs> so I'm just going to let her tell the stories. But they were story toppers. They were experience toppers. If you had an angelic visitation in your living room, they had 15 angels drinking coffee with you in the morning. (laughs) This is the state of the Corinthian church. If you had an interesting or special camp experience as a youth, they had dinner with Jesus himself. (laughs) They were the Instagram of the day. Everything on Instagram is so much better than whatever you're doing right now. That's what it feels like, doesn't it? So what happened is that they would, they would, they would get together at these Jesus gatherings, the believing community, and this is what would happen. Some people would eat to excess, so much so that other people at the dinner wouldn't even get any food. They weren't honoring one another. Instead of being equal at the table of God, the status and the power and the hierarchies of the world still impacted the table fellowship of that moment. Paul said, that's not okay. You can't show up to the church potluck getting slammed drunk and eating all the food so that this guy doesn't eat anything. What are we doing here? You're eating and drinking in an unworthy manner. Don't do it. Paul actually extends it a pretty severe warning to the Corinthian church. He says, I think, guys, here's the deal. Because you are not honoring God in this way, I'm concerned. I'm, I'm, some of you are sick. Some of you are, are dealing with some of these health things because of this issue. Now, I want, I want you to know that that's not a scare tactic. What it helps us to remind, what it helps to remind us of is that as we look inward, that there are consequences to how we engage with Jesus. God is not just waiting for us to make a mistake and then boom, you're sick. And then boom, you're messed up. No, no, God wants to draw us closer and closer to his heart by any and all means necessary. So they were doing these things. They were, they weren't, honoring that moment. 
In fact, he says, if you want to avoid the judgment of God in that moment, he says, judge yourself. Yet we are, when we are judged by the Lord, we're being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. If we examine ourselves, we will not be judged by God in this way. When we take communion looking inward, we examine ourselves. And we say, God, what do I need to take care of? Most of our world and the culture of our time is designed and built around serving me to make my life a little bit more convenient, a little bit more safer, a a, a little bit more um, adept to my needs and my desires. But communion reminds us, no, that I, as Jesus asked me to do, must lose my life in order to gain my life. How are we looking inward this morning, family? You know, what's crazy is that the communion table of the New Testament church would have been the only place where you would have seen true equality. See, in the Roman world, hierarchy was a very, very big deal, and and you can see that reflected in even our Western culture today. Power struggles and hierarchies and all these different things that determine value and status. When you go to a dinner table in the New Testament world, if you have higher status and more money, guess what? You get a bigger portion, and you get to sit closer to the host of the dinner party. If you don't have any of those things, you can maybe hang around the foyer or the foyer Maybe you can hang around there. Maybe you get a little bit of a scrap of food. And maybe, if you're lucky, see, but at the table fellowship of the early New Testament church, every, every status symbol was laid at the door. Everything that would have removed, that would have caused, if I came in because I came from a poor family and I was dishonored because of this reason or that, and my societal role was determined, when I stepped at the table of believers, the laborer was sitting right next to the CEO. And together at that table, as they remembered and they looked inward, they found themselves equal at the table of God's grace because grace is the great equalizer. It reminds us that I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. But still, he gave himself away. Looking inward. It also causes us to look outward. If communion is an invitation to look inward, it's also our invitation to look outward. See, communion, church, our worship experience, it's not our opportunity for for what I heard someone say, for spiritual navel gazing. Isn't that a weird phrase? Literally, who is gazing at their navel? Just a side conversation. We'll talk about it later, along with the Woodstock conversation. (laughs) So, so the, 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 we're not just focusing so inward in our culture of, oh, it's self-love and me love and me, 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 me. What we do is we recognize that, yes, Jesus Christ died for me, but Jesus Christ died for we. And in fact, I cannot be me without you. And so it's an outward expression. Even the symbols themselves are evangelistic. They they are a message to people who don't recognize Jesus as Lord, that the bread was his body broken for every person on the planet. That is, the wine was his blood poured out as a sacrifice for you and for me. Oh, it looks outward. And it causes us to look outward. It causes us as Enemies are as foes of God, like Romans said, even though we were still yet sinners. He died for us. I was an enemy of God, and, and yet he died for me. This is what communion invites me into. See, after the cross came the commission. That cross moment in the Gospels was followed by that commission moment of the risen Jesus saying, go ahead, go out. Encourage, teach people, teach people about what I've taught you. Go, baptize them. Baptism Sunday, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Teach them my ways. And Acts 1 is the commissioning moment that you have been endued with power from on high to be witnesses to God, to your community. For them, it was Judea, it was Samaria, it was uh, Jerusalem, and then the, the ends of the world. I know I did that out of order, I'm aware. But it's our opportunity to say, how do we then, as we remind ourselves of communion, yes, as I look inward, I'm reminded of what he's done for me, but 
Because of what he's done for me, how do I treat my neighbor next door? How am I treating my cousin that I'm not getting along with right now? How do I teach and share my faith, a thing that gives me hope for something more than just what is in this life? And I believe that the local church, the local church, not a conference, oh no, not a conference. Oh, I'm so stoked on conferences, they're fantastic, they get me all fired up. But I think the local church, the local church, the gathered body of you and me, the gathered people of God, what the Bible calls the ecclesia, the called out ones, that's you and me, that we are to reflect the very face of God to a world looking in. We are not to look inward, we're to look outward. Communion reminds us that our faith is not just an inward faith that it is an outward expression of how we live. It is the most powerful example. And we have to look at each other. We have to look at ourselves as a community. See, membership is loose sort of in, in the, the, the current or contemporary culture of church. People come in and out, and, and when, when someone doesn't like what that pastor said, then they'll go over to that one, and there's, sometimes there's not as much of a commitment to a community as there would have been in the New Testament church. It was so intertwined with who they were as a community, as a culture. But what communion reminds us is that you and I equally have a responsibility to share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And now somebody's like, nope, <laughs> not going to do it, not going to stand on a soapbox on Luna Lilo Drive and start yelping out stuff about Jesus. You don't have to. Some of you might. That would be pretty wild. Wow. But... All it means is that we live with an intentionality to say when the conversations come, we're just going to have them. You can so freely share your faith just in everything that you do every day. I love what Martin Luther said when people were worried about making an impact and how they were supposed to make an impact for their faith, even in their workplace. He said, look, if you're a shoemaker and you're a Christian, you don't need to etch a cross into your shoe to prove that you're a Christian. Just make a good shoe. Just be excellent in everything that you do. Communion reminds us of our outward expression. Amen? It's an invitation to look backwards. Paul says, I pass on to you what I received from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's getting revelation from God about what the significance of communion is. That moment, the night as he was betrayed, he breaks bread, he gives it to his disciples. He says, do this in remembrance of me. He pours the wine. They partake. As often as you do this, he says, remember me. It's a call to look back to the cross. It's a call that as much as we want to go forward and do these different things in our life, it's a call for us to look back to the cross on what he has done. You know what's interesting is so many symbols over Christian history have emerged to represent faith, to represent Christianity. There's anchors, there's doves, there's flames, there's ships. There's all kinds of different symbols that have emerged and stayed. For a long time, it was the fish. It was the ichthys. And that was a Greek acrostic for, I believe it's Jesus Christ, Son of God, and there's another piece to there, and I'll get it to you. But it was an ichthys, and, and what they would do is the persecuted church in that first century, if they were looking for shelter, if they were looking for hospitality somewhere, and they wanted to know if you were a fellow believer, they would draw an ark in the sand or in the dirt. Inconspicuous enough, maybe you're standing next to me thinking, well, that was weird, and you move on with your day. But if you were a believer in that New Testament church, what you would do is you would finish that ark in the sand and it would take the shape of a fish. And for years and years, that was the secret symbol of the persecuted church as they tried to express their faith and do their communion. But see, over time, even the ichthys was overshadowed by the power of the cross. The symbol of death, it would be like hanging an electric chair around your neck. It would be like every detestable thing you could imagine that is symbolized somewhere and using that as a marker for who you are. Oh, but for the redeeming power of God, family, 
Look, some of you are looking at your life as you look inward, and maybe you're thinking that part can't be redeemed. Look, if Jesus can redeem the cross as a symbol for his hope, restoration, and healing, he can redeem your past. Right now, he could redeem your past. If he can redeem that moment, if he can redeem what would be effectively the electric chair, the firing squad, the hangman's noose, then he can redeem the first 10 years of your marriage that was difficult. He can redeem the, the last couple of years as, as your children have gone through teenage and young adulthood and you're not seeing eye to eye anymore. He can redeem it as we look backward to the power of the cross. We recognize that that power is over every area of our life. Somebody give glory to God for that. The cross is our message. The other messages are temporary, but the message of the cross will last. Other messages that are self-fulfillment, see, they'll come and go. There's a new philosophy every other week. There's a new book that you can buy on the Amazon, you know, dot com and on the New York, seller, New York Times bestseller list. But the message of the cross remains. What does it mean to you as you look inward and you look outward? As you look backward, when did it become real for you? When, do you remember when? When you were faced with the reckless love of God, with, with the love that didn't make sense, because if you were looking at you at that moment of your life, you would have just passed you on by, but no, Jesus stopped and he rescued you and me out of our sin, death, and destruction. See, the cross looking backward is the only reason why the last piece is that we can look forward. The cross looking backward to who we are in him is the only reason why we can look forward to the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. I remember when I was 16, the power of the cross changed my life. I was in a small church, small church. Half of this section, probably, on a Sunday night. I didn't want to be there. My youth pastor, who was an ex-prison inmate guy, was like, you better come. And I was like, fine, okay. <laughs> Jeez, your tattoos are scaring me. It was the Simpsons were on that night. I had other things to do, you know. So I show up at the church, and, and what I see is this. is I, I see a small gathering of worship, and, and I see this woman in the front row, and man, whatever she's feeling, she is feeling it because she is weeping uncontrollably. And as a 16-year-old young man, I said, whatever that is, I don't want it. It was like, whoa. But then I remember this moment that happened. I can't really explain it. Many of you have experienced that as well, a moment where you sense the presence of God. And I remember it was as if God spoke to me, not like audibly, I'm not like a voodoo weird guy, but it was like the, the voice of God, the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us, spoke to like the quiet place of my heart, and he told me that he would be my father now. And I remember at 16, just what, something unlocked in my heart. It was the cross that helped me realize that I wasn't an orphan, that I wasn't broken, that I had a future and a hope in Christ. Come on, come on. I was 16 years old. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Till he comes, he's coming. If you woke up this morning and did your devotions, you would read 2 Peter chapter 3. And what you would read is this, is that the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Remember that uh, a thousand years is as a day, and a day is as a thousand years to the Lord. He is not slack concerning his promises. And what are the promises? Well, in that context, he's talking about the promise of Jesus returning to fulfill all that he has promised us as his people. But see, God is a promise maker, and he's a promise fulfiller. What are we looking forward to? We're looking forward to the glory of Christ's return, and we are looking forward to breakthroughs in our family right now. We're looking forward to the promises of maybe physical healing right now. 
Look, I'm praying right now. There's things going on in the world. Japan getting hit by these different catastrophes. You got Reading on fire. We have people in our community that are dealing with illnesses and challenges. I am contending and believing for the promise of faith that God is a healer. And I want to pray those audacious prayers because I have no choice but to believe God for what he has said and to trust him even when I don't understand. We look forward in faith. Communion this morning is our reminder that we look in, we look out. We look back and we look forward. Buzz Aldrin on, on the surface of the moon, he, he, he said this, to, 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 to base, to mission control. I'd like to give this opportunity and take this opportunity to ask everyone listening in, whoever and wherever they may be, to pause for a moment and to contemplate the events of the past few hours and to give thanks in his or her own way. He stopped the radio transmission at that moment, and on the surface of the moon, 250,000 miles from home. He read John. And the scripture that he read, he said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. In the radio blackout, he said, he, he opened up his little, his little can, his, his little wine thing, and, and he said that in the chalice, the wine just started creeping up the side because of the lack of gravity. And he took it. And he took that wafer with Neil Armstrong present and took communion. And he thought to himself, I ate this and it was interesting to think that right here, I was giving thanks for the intelligence and the spirit that had brought two young pilots to the Sea of Tranquility. But it was interesting that the very first liquid ever poured out on the moon and the very first food ever eaten were the communion elements. And it's interesting to think that some of the first words spoken on the moon were the words of Jesus, who made the earth and the moon, and whom, as he quotes Dante, himself the love that moves the sun and stars. This morning we're going to take communion and ushers. You can prepare yourself. Our team is going to come and, and, and we're going to sing a worship song this morning. We're going to continue singing that reckless love song. And as you do, I want you to take this moment to look inward. Some of you, even as I'm speaking, and you're, we're, we're talking about eating and drinking in an unworthy manner, maybe you just there's some things as you look inward you've got to take care of. Look, if you have to let that communion bowl pass you by this morning, there is no shame in that moment. There's no shame in that moment because what we're doing is we're saying, I'm going to trust Jesus and, and right now i got to handle some things before I do that. You don't have to be perfect to take communion. But as we do, look inward. Be reminded of what God is asking you to participate in, in his mission on the planet, in his mission in your neighborhood, in his mission at your workplace. The outward gaze. Look backward at the power of the cross and be reminded of what Jesus has saved you from. And look forward at the future, that glorious future that he's called you to, the hope that we will not be disappointed in because he's given us his Holy Spirit the way that Romans talks about the hope that we have in Christ, the future hope of a promise fulfilled.